If I can have sex with the podcast, it would be American Timelines by History for Jerks. American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com. History, 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 history for Jerks. Welcome to another episode of American, American Timelines. Timelines. I'm Amy. And I am Thomas Crapper, born in Thorne, South Yorkshire in 1836. And I was baptized on September 28th, 1836. My dad was a sailor. My brother George was a plumber. Mm -hmm. And I am known, I was known as a sanitary engineer. And a lot of people know me for inventing the modern toilet, Thomas Crapper. What what did they have before that? Uh, like a hole. Uh, they would just poop in a, a probably in the woods or a f hole in the floor. Maybe I invented. Uh, actually, I actually. Um, I'm, it's often been claimed that Crapper came gave me like people used my name to come up with the word crap. Right. Uh, but that's not actually true. Oh, just a coincidence? No, yeah. The word crap is actually of Middle English origin and predates its application of bodily waste. Uh, okay. It was a combination of two other words, the Dutch crappen to pluck off or cut off or separate, Ew. and the Old French crappy, which were siftings and waste or rejected matter. Oh, so God. a lot of people think crapper made it, but no. Yeah, crapper... Uh, and here's the funny thing is, me, Thomas Crapper, I died of colon cancer. What are the chances? Uh, irony. Yeah. So that's Joe. And this is a podcast a that brings you all the crazy, nostalgic, interesting things from the past. And we do it year by year. And today, we are going to discuss 1964. 1964, y'all. We're in the middle of the hot summer of 1964. That's right. And the things were changing. Life was changing. People were changing there civil was rights civil going. rights were coming up this july of 1964 is the biggest thing of civil rights yeah that's right and we'll jump right into it we're right there right mm -hmm. Do we have to apologize for anything probably but i'm not aware i'm not interested i'd like you to apologize for your behavior i don't think i have any i'd like problem to do a quick shout behavior. out to gwen lorenzen who's listening boom Gwen, oh, okay. Queen Gwen, she's on Twitter. She doesn't listen all the time, but sometimes she does. And she told me she thinks her grandmother might have been a Carlo White. Really? Yeah, she said she started listening and had to tweet me. She said, oh, I love this Carlo Summer stuff. And uh, I told her that he was, they had all those followers, and she said, my grandma followed some kind of weird church. I'll find out from my mom if it was. Oh, you know, my so we'll, gosh. We'll hear back from Queen Gwen. She's all on right. Twitter. Anyway, she's hilarious. Uh, okay. And she so, uh, broke her school box in the middle school. Like she sat in front of me and she fell out of her chair <laughs> and fell on top of her school box and it broke everywhere. And I, st <laughs> I still mention that to her every time. I'm sure you do. Her. I know you she do. She loves it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Thursday, July 2nd, 1964. That's where we left off at the end of June. Mm -hmm. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, which ended segregation in public places and banned employment discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Yes. It's considered one of the crowning legislative achievements of the civil rights movement. Yes. First proposed by JFK, it survived strong opposition from Southern members of Congress and was then signed into law by LBJ. Awesome. In subsequent years, Congress expanded the act and passed additional civil rights legislation, such as the Voting Rights Act of 65. Yeah. Uh, but there were white business owners who claimed that Congress did not have the constitutional mm -hmm. authority to ban segregation in public accommodations. For example. Like hotels? Yeah. Morton Rolston, owner of a... Morton Rolston, the owner of a motel in Atlanta, 
said he should not be forced to serve black travelers, saying the fundamental question is whether or not Congress has the power to take away the liberty of an individual to run his business as he sees fit uh, in the selection of customers. Kind of like this whole birthday cake now in modern times. People won't make birthday uh, cakes right. for yeah. gay people. And, yep. um, and now, I mean, it's kind of funny how the, it's weird how it's just, it's, so many things are parallel mm-hmm. to what's happening now. The big in the news now is they're trying to analyze whether discrimination on sex includes people who are transgender mm-hmm. or not or gay because mm-hmm. um, there's all kinds of rules you yeah. can't be sexist you can't fire somebody because they're a woman yeah but if there's transgender yeah but the supreme court is actually considering well it doesn't say doesn't say you can't fire somebody for because they're gay you know they can't just look at it common sense they right can't just say of course you can't they can't just learn from the past no they, they have to they it has to be a all big all over again. fight and a big fucking struggle fucking for every struggle. group fucking that struggle. comes along they Fuck. they can't just say let's realize that that you can't stop progress you can try to slow it down and that's it that's actually true you can't stop progress it's going to it's going to happen and then people are going to look back and they're going to say look at those assholes that didn't agree with this. It's like they used to say about uh Lawrence Taylor, you can't stop him, you know, you can only hope to contain him. Mhm. Yeah. Right? All right. What's next? But also on that same day, almost more importantly than this whole civil rights mm-hmm. act uh that was passed, um WWF referee Charles Robinson was born. No, that's not uh, more important. That same day. So, I mean, well, not more important, but equally important. Do like you? That referee and no. the whole Civil Rights Act, about the same. Oh, my God. What do you think? No, no. Uh, maybe not. What's next? Charles Robinson was born in Charlotte, North Carolina. There just wasn't enough wrestling on the last episode, so I needed to. And plus birthdays, wrestling plus birthdays. In my opinion, me happy. there was a perfect amount of wrestling in the last episode. Just Perfect. Uh, well, apparently you didn't hear me uh, uh, mention Greg the Hammer Valentine under my breath. No, oh, I didn't. I missed it. If you go back and listen at uh, around 2538 mm-hmm. at that mark, I go, oh, Greg the Hammer Valentine, like that. So okay. there was wrestling. Well, that's how you talk about all wrestling. I'll, that'll be fine with me. I'm getting a tattoo of Greg the Hammer Valentine on my back. Okay, let's move on. whole face. Saturday, July 4th, 1964. Uh, we got a new number one song on the Billboard charts Okay, by a uh, young group you may have heard of, the uh, Beach Boys. You ever hear of the mm-hmm. Beach Boys? You ever hear of them? Oh, sure. An autobiographical narrative, I Get Around, begins with a multi-part a cappella introduction. It quickly shifts into rock-style verses sung by Mike Love and a pop chorus sung in falsetto by Brian Wilson. Who also produced and arranged the song. This is a good one. During its recording session, Wilson's father, Murray, was relieved of his duties as the group's manager. Whoa. During, while they're recording this. Burn. So you're fired. You're fired, Dad. Yeah. He goes back and sing it. Yeah. Da, 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 da. You're fired, Dad. You're fired, Dad. Get the fuck out. All right. I get around. In 2017, I Get Around was inducted in the Grammy Hall of Fame. Yeah, that's a good song. Of course, I just I can't think of the Beach Boys without thinking of um, Charles Manson. Uh, why they're firing their dad? Wait, no, what? because because he he was the Wilson. Not was it Brian Wilson? I think it might have been Brian Wilson. Carney Wilson was friends with Charles Manson, and Charles Manson he he had he almost signed him. What? As a, for a record deal. There's music. Charles Manson's music. You can listen to it online. What? And I'll go into it I have a feeling, in 1969. But I have a feeling everything makes you think of a murderer. <laughs> like, all you think about is murderer. Well, I'm You're researching it. Me. Please, everyone, call the police immediately. Use this episode as evidence when I'm murdered. Okay? No. She's listen. She's going to murder me. You think that's real funny, but what happens if you did get murdered? It's you. You did it. Obviously, you did it. No. You're going to murder me. I know it. Oh, my God. Don't say that. No, I'm so ner- Here's what I think we should start doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike Berbiglia, who's a stand-up mm-hmm. comedian, you know, he's got the show right mm-hmm. now about how he's got this horrible sleep disorder, kind of like our friend Ryan Burkett, where he gets up and he can't control himself at night. Like, mm-hmm. And they said, you could harm somebody and hurt somebody really bad. So he had his kids and stuff. So he has to sleep in... <laughs> He used to like sleep in a locked room and in a 
he has to wear gloves. That oh he my can't god! Open it and wear it like a suit. Like you have to zip him up in a like a straight jacket. Yeah, in a straight jacket at night. And he's got a sheet. Oh my god! A sheet that goes on his bed. It's got a hole for his head where he can't move. Can't his move. Arm so he won't kill anyone. Oh I my think, god! I think you need to start sleeping in that. <laughs> you just should make that up. No, it's true. Really? His one man show. I just saw the new one. Uh, has talks about that. That's it's a great insane. show. By the way, I think that's a really rare disorder. I don't think Ryan has that. Well, Ryan wakes up. He doesn't know where he is. I know. That's called sleepwalking, honey. Yeah, this one, what he's got is way, I think, probably worse. Like sleep psychosis or something. Yeah, I think that's what Ryan has, too. Ryan Burkett from the music video podcast. That's right. Friend of the show. Friend, friend of, of the show. Friend of enjoyment. Friend of hugs. He likes to be picked up and hugged and squeezed and sniffed. Okay. Uh, anyway, and then on Sunday, July 5th, 1964, Jerry Sags was born in Allentown, Pennsylvania. He is one half of the Nasty Boys, also a fat piece of garbage. What? Missing a bunch of teeth. He's a wrestler. Oh. oh and then geez. Saturday, July 18th, 1964, mm-hmm. we got a new number one song on the Billboard charts. The Beach Boys didn't last for very long. Yeah, I'm surprised. Well, it was. Uh, they weren't the Beatles. No, that's true. Very different. I mean, Beatles are better. We have the Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. This is written by Bob Crew and Bob Gaudio. Oh, yeah, I know this. Recorded by the Four Seasons and released as a single in 1964. Ooh. According to songwriter Bob Gaudio, the recording was inspired by a dirty faced little girl, about five years old. It's all ragdoll. Dressed in ragged clothes. Yep. Yeah. At stoplights in the neighborhood, children would run into the street and clean windshields for spare change. But this little girl could only reach high enough to clean the driver's side mirror of his automobile. And so instead of stopping to help her, he (laughs) He wrote wrote a song song about about her. When Gaudio reached into... No, he listen. When Gaudio reached into his wallet, all he had were uh, notes. None smaller than $20. He gave the girl a $20 bill. Oh, God bless him. Yep. She's like a five-year-old. Her... (laughs) She got 20 bucks. Jeez. Her astonishment stayed in Gaudio's mind as he approached the recording studio. Ragdoll with a few tweaks by Bob Crew was the result. And he thought that was a good story to tell. He thought that story would put him in a good light. What was he going to do? Take her home and, and Call wash some her? some social services and at least get her in foster care for crying out loud. It was the loud. 60s. Kids were just out there. It's like the, it's the Blatchkey kids all running around. I I don't think so. You ever see the Dance With Myself video? <laughs> mean anything. With Billy Idol, all those zombies are chasing him. Same thing. Just uh, that child doesn't even zombies. relate. Anyway, that's your favorite song of all time. No, it's not. Definitely not. It is. You listen to it on repeat all the time. And then on July 21st, 1964, I understand that you have something for us. Okay, yes. You crazy loon. I'm great. Let me guess. Somebody's going to be bleeding and being raped at the same time. No, this episode is rape-free. Oh, thank God. Another rape-free episode of American Timeline. That's right. Brought to you now, by... Now, less rape. Ortho Carolina. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, I guess it's kind of Ortho Carolina. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ortho Carolina provides less rape. So I'm going to talk about the murder of Dr. Mary Sherman. Oh, my gosh. A murder? A murder. Well, I, I have to say I am grateful a couple episodes ago we did Aliens. Yeah, a see a little, little respite. And I like that Alien story. It was probably the most believable one mm-hmm. so far. Yeah, it's pretty good. Okay, so at 4 a.m. July 21st, 1964. Oh, July 21st, 1964. Mm-hmm. The same night that High Adventure with Lowell Thomas was on. <laughs> High Adventure was an American TV series presented by Lowell Thomas. Who's Lowell Thomas? Uh, he was a guy that presented that TV series. It ran on CBS from 55 to 58. Mm-hmm. Uh, one episode was made by Australian producer Lee Robinson. Uh, and this episode is called Australian All- Outback and involved the search for explorer Harold Lasseter, who was an explorer in Australia. And Robinson mm-hmm. claimed he found Lasseter's bones, but then he was charged with an offense by the government uh, for disturbing a body like there's some kind of law in australia about disturbing buried bones or something so they got sued and had to go to court for years and was eventually this was a drama it was like an adventure show it was like a live adventure show. okay yes on that same night uh but that same night that what happened um there was this routine call came into new orleans police 
this routine call came the same day that Susan Swift was born, who played Audrey Rose in the movie Audrey oh, Rose yeah. that our daughter's named after. Um, Juan Valdez was the, a tenant at the Patio's Apartments on St. Charles Avenue. Wait, the Not Juan the Valdez? Juan, no, a different Juan Valdez. Are you sure? Yeah. He said he could Not smell smoke. Not the coffee smoke. guy? He said he could smell smoke. Through the coffee? Officers arrived at the scene to find a blaze in apartment J at the back of the building. Oh, boy. A blaze in apartment J in the back of the building. So firefighters hauled out a burning mattress, and they found the body of Dr. Mary Sherman lying face up on the floor. She was severely burned on her right side. Her wait, liver, wait, 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 intestines, wait, wait. and charred lung were exposed, and wait. her right arm and right torso were gone. Wait. Back up. They removed a burning mattress. And underneath the mattress on, on the floor lay the body of Dr. Mary Sherman. Underneath the mattress. So she was under the bed? Well, it was a mattress that was just laying on top of her. Oh, she was laying on the floor and the mattress yeah, was on top of her. It wasn't right. like on a box spring. Yeah. Whoa. What? And did you hear the part of her injuries? She was laying injuries? face up with her torso. What? Say it again. She was severely burned on her right side. Yeah. Her liver, intestines, and charred lungs were exposed. Oh. And her right arm and right torso were gone. Her right arm and her right torso were gone? And, and there are photographs online so i oh. warn everybody i did see these how do you how do you search for these dr mary sherman <laughs> dr. but mary i'm telling sherman, you gross like you if just, you have a strong the murder stomach, of dr mary sherman or just dr mary sherman and these pictures will come up i am about to throw up just thinking about it so i'm it's definitely really not gonna, bad so and i mean i can no, you i can handle you tub girl handle. but i can't handle this yeah that's true i can handle tub girl any day so there's blood on the walls, floor, and chest, and it indicated that she had been stabbed in her apartment. She was sliced through the heart and several uh, times in the abdomen and on her left arm, possible yo. self-defense wounds. Uh, so, And you like this? Why? Like, why do you like <laughs> talking about this? Aside from the bed, there wasn't a lot Mr. of... Mr. Belvedere or something? The bed had fire damage, but the rest of the room, there really wasn't a lot of fire damage. The curtains and furniture were unaffected. Okay. And they looked at the door locks, and there wasn't any evidence of a break-in. So, and her her purse and her jewelry and even prescription drugs were all still there. Okay, so that's not, yeah, it's just a brutal murder, I guess. Oh, so gosh, neighbors so told police that Sherman's car was missing from its usual parking spot at the complex. Oh. The detectives found it at 1.08 p.m. that day, about nine blocks from Sherman's house. A tube of lipstick, an empty Diet Right can, and a black perfume dispenser lay on the street, and a spent cartridge of a tear gas can container was found nearby. Well, at least they were dieting. The, that's true. Whoever did that, at least they were drinking a diet soda. And then the car, but the car keys were missing. And then the following day, a man was clipping his hedge in, three blocks away, and he found the car keys. Oh. And they couldn't find any fingerprints. No fingerprints, but he found the car keys in the hedges. And the coroner ruled that Sherman had been killed by a stab wound in the heart. Oh, man. Though the murder occurred 50 years ago, it remained un it remains unsolved. Oh, we still don't know anything about it? We still don't know who did oh, it. Oh, the end. Theorists and crime writers <laughs> <laughs> yeah. have alleged a government cover-up as well as connections to the assassination of John F. Kennedy. What? What could this have to do with that? Well, I'm going to tell you. Oh, she might be a witness? The police She's report... She's on a Zapruder film? No. Oh. The police report contains a never-before-publicized pub... never letter from the Metropolitan Crime Commission, which reported receiving a call from an anonymous woman. Anonymous? The woman anonymous? said that Sherman was the second one of my friends here at Oshner who had been mysteriously killed in the past year. Uh -oh. She told the MCC that Latin Americans wrapped in casts were coming into Oshner Clinic and disseminating drugs in a narcotics operation that went all the way up to a mafia boss, Carlos Marcello. Wait, what was happening? La Latino <laughs> people in casts? In casts what? were coming into the clinic and giving out drugs. To who? I guess... Just people on the street? It was a narcotics operation. Oh. So, but they... So, so they were... They were distributing illegal drugs, yes. is what you're saying, in, yes. the, in waiting rooms of yeah. clinics? Yeah, I guess. Okay. But that uh, the allegations aren't even in the police report. They were never taken seriously. Oh, so these are just false allegations. It was just some, that's one, one, one thing that happened. So to talk about, let me tell you who Dr. Mary Sherman was just a little bit. Who was Dr. Mary Sherman? She was born in Chicago in 1913. Wow. She was... Um, 
she tr- sung opera, was trained by her father to sing opera. So she was born in Chicago before the Cubs curse. Yes. And as most women mm-hmm. who are murdered, uh, the same thing. Uh, as most women what? who are murdered, she was also trained to sing opera. Okay. That... Almost every murderer, murdered person, murdered victim sings opera. Okay. So... She um, got her medical degree from University of Chicago. Oh, that's that's nothing to sneeze at. She was an internationally known orthopedic surgeon. Really? Known for her work in the treatment and research Ortho of, Carolina, shout of out. bone cancers. She was the director of Bone Pathology Lab at Oshner Medical Foundation. That's a big deal for a woman at this age, I in know, this era. This time. That's good. And she also mingled with the literary set in the French Quarter. She Novelist Max White and playwright Chris Blake. Oh, so she big wigs. Yeah. So there is no need for Me Too movement because women are just as or even more successful than men, right? No, that's not true. They're better than me. Okay. Yep. All uh, right. Um, You'll have to edit Can we this. renew our vows right now? In August of 1964, yeah. investigators took apart her apartment and they made note of everything they, that they wanted to put into evidence. Okay. They interviewed um, the young couple that lived in between Sherman and Juan Valdez, who had made the phone call. Right, the coffee guy. And they, um, but then th- that later on, decades later, the same couple was interviewed by by like somebody writing a book, and their story was different than what they had told the police. So police interviewed the young couple living between Sherman and Juan Valdez who had called in here smelling the smoke. Right. And um, they recalled how Valdez had, in, he had an interest in orchids and he'd have rare flowers delivered to his home all the time. But and they that, didn't put this in the police report. Right. And that he could be heard flushing his toilet over and over. And they didn't know what that was about. Well, maybe he's got irritable bowel syndrome. And Why that, wouldn't they mention that in the police? Report? And then also that police officers would come in and out of his house all the time at all hours. Oh, and, witness protection. And so they didn't know if he was just quirky New Orleans character or this drug ring kingpin running with corrupt officers. Or maybe it's got something to do with the JFK assassination. Well, that comes that comes later. Oh, so we already yeah, said that. So I thought. Also, though. Os, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was seen going into Valdez's apartment. What? Now that not and, you should have uh, led with that. That's a, yeah. That's he was breaking he, news. He said that one. These neighbors said that one time he knocked on their door asking if they knew where he was. Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah. Well, there's also because you know remember he was in New Orleans at this time. I don't remember that, but I but there's also a good chance all these people are coming over to Juan Valdez's house because they love his freaking coffee. That's true, bro. So there was this guy, Steven Tyler. Right. Who Not Aerosmith. Not Aerosmith. Although he's old enough to have been 40 That's at true. this time. Yeah. He was working on a documentary on the case for 10 years. Okay. Steven Tyler. And Tyler's. he said, New Orleans oh, embraces yeah. bizarre characters. It tolerates them. And on the micro level, these people typified the, or exemplified New Orleans characters. That's right. On the macro level, people talk about six degrees of separation. This is more like two degrees of separation talking about Oswald with Valdez and then with Mary Sherman. You got the coffee guy. You got Stephen Tyler from Aerosmith. You got yep. uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. That's so crazy. There Where's was John a, Wilkes Booth? There was a writer named Edward Haslam, and he wrote a book about the case. He did? And his theory on the Sherman crime is rooted in his belief that her body, as documented in the photos that you can see, I don't see could it. not have been burned in an ordinary house fire. Yeah, and it says part of her body's missing and stuff. Here is the big point: she did not die in her apartment, is what he says. Yeah. He says, according to his book, she worked in a secret uptown laboratory devoted to mutating viruses and monkeys. Whoa! And she was trying to find a vaccine for cancer by doing that. Uh-huh. But there was also this government-backed plan to create a biological weapon that could be used to kill Fidel Castro. Yeah, I, I, that, I, I'm with you. I'm with him. I'm so with her. to that end, Sherman was involved in work at a second, smaller, even more secret laboratory in the basement of David Ferry's home in New Orleans. And David Ferry was part of that whole New Orleans plot that JFK Oliver Stone movie was about. 
Oh, God. So it comes around him. Okay. And she, there was a laboratory in the basement of his home in New Orleans. He was an ex-pilot who had served on Civil Air Patrol with Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah, this is, this is really getting creepy, man. And who, along with the FBI agent Guy Bannister, was accused by New Orleans DA Jim Garrison of conspiring to assassinate JFK. Jim Garrison. So Sherman's story, according to this writer... Yeah. had more to do with Cuba and Castro. The doctor was pulled into a plan to use her cancer research to develop a lethal virus that could be used on the Cuban dictator. Wow. The work involved a high-voltage linear particle accelerator installed on the grounds of the old U.S. Public Health Hospital uptown. It was used to mutate viruses, which were then injected into mice in Ferry's basement. Yeah, this all sounds right. So right. He's, he, what he thinks happened is that on the night in question, there was an accident in the secret, secret lab right. that burned the doctor severely. But they didn't want anybody to know right. the, that this was happening or being developed. Yes, because he thinks the, the electrical currents and the intense heat would have just blown her arm right off. But unable to revive her, and they didn't want to keep, they didn't want to, the, the project to be, you know, they wanted to keep it confidential. So they just stabbed her they through the heart? They stabbed her to stage a murder. And moved her body to her apartment and faked the murder scene. But then there's these pathologists who reviewed the photos and police reports, and they disagreed. They yeah, I don't buy that. I think they would just put her like they would like totally put her in like a container of acid or something like. Uh, I don't know why they have to bad. stage a murder scene. Why wouldn't they just put her back in her apartment and leave her there? I mean, it would have been as much of a mystery. Or just never, or just have her disappear. Like, they could dissolve yeah. her in acid or bury her yeah. the, if they have all these secret That's places. That's true, yeah. So these pathologists Shoot her out of said a, cannon. a normal fire could have caused the severe burns shown in the photograph. Um, the unevenness of the burn, her left side of the body, legs and feet appear to be relatively untouched, is only indicative that someone doused the affected area with an accelerant and lightly lit the mattress or something else on fire and placed it on top of her. So that's what these pathologists think happened. They think she was alive. She, yes. Burned or stabbed and then that. Another forensic pathologist noted that the burned mattress with the box springs visible in the photo accounts for the severe fire burns to the right side of her body. He said based on the photos in the report, he believed she was stabbed to death and partially burned after death to attempt to conceal the homicide. All right yeah. there in that room. Well, maybe. What's the motive, man? Both um, both of the, those pathologists said it appeared she died of a stab wound to the heart, not smoke inhalation, which indicates that she was she, she was set on fire after she after died. After she died. A third p- forensic pathologist. All these forensic pathologists, baby. Just says, no, no, around. the photos are too poor quality. There's no toxicology report. There's no autopsy records. It makes it difficult to make a conclusive judgment. So back off. And this guy says, I just find it strange that the upper extremity, bone and all, was completely incinerated while the rest of the torso spared. If the body was stabbed and burned elsewhere and then dumped in the apartment at a later time, the, that might explain the lack of fire damage to the apartment and the uneven burn pattern. Now I'm with this guy, this nerdy guy who's got a nerdy voice. <laughs> I'm with this nerd. <laughs> It's that burn pattern that helped cement the conspiracy theory about the JFK thing. Yeah. Um, they said no way that part of her body, no way was that part of her body that was mutilated was done by fire. It had to be something much stronger. Yeah. Chemicals. So there's another book where um, there's a quote by a, the lead detective saying that he believed the murder may have been committed by the very man who called the police to discover the body, Juan Valdez. Juan Valdez. He doesn't just make coffee. He murders people and then flushes the toilet a bunch after he poops. Yep. It reveals that although he was responsible for halting the blaze, the, the, the police report, the case file, it reveals that although he was responsible for halting the blaze, by alerting police, he was still somewhat a suspect character. Huh. His former landlady told police he had made obscene advances or suggestions toward one of her employees. Well, and a prominent attorney said something about advances that he made to her. Oh, uh, maybe he was making advances. Maybe a young couple was... nearby had placed a restraining order on him. Oh boy! A year later, a tenant of the patio apartments building told police that Valdez would tell and retell the story of Sherman's murder, making claims that he had known Sherman well. 
information that he never had told the police when he told them. He just said she would only say good morning to him. Yeah. But she was probably trying to get attention, too. Like, hey, I know her. I know that lady. You want to talk to me? Well, because, and his, what he had told police initially is more close to what, who she was. She was a person who kept to herself and she was a real ball buster at work and tough on new doctors and stuff. A ball buster? Yeah. She's a ball buster. But she wasn't a very a friendly. Secret, secret labs. She wasn't a very friendly person. So, um, no, he can't speak ill of the dead. No, take that back. Police wanted the murder weapon, but they never found it. They wanted, they thought it would be look like kind of like a scalpel. Um, one morning after the murder, a 72 year old man reported that a young man approached him with a surgical instrument and attempted to cut him. What it happened, and on July 23rd, oh, July 23rd, 1964, yeah, the same day that. Egyptian munition ship Star of Alexandria explodes at Dockside in Bone, Algeria. A hundred people die, 160 injured, $20 million in damage. Yes. That same day? That same day. Another doctor at Oshner, the the clinic that Mary Sherman worked at. Yeah. Her name was Carolyn Talley. Carolyn Talley. She received a threatening phone call, and it was a man's voice saying she was going to be next. Oh. At the hospital, police searched Sherman's office for any evidence of her personal life with negative results. And Wait, it, at the, the secret at, office underground no, in a bunker? No, at, at the clinic. Oh. At the hospital that she worked at. Oh. An I interview in December, detectives bunker. started questioning doctors specifically about a resident who had worked under Sherman. Stanley Stumpf was his name. Stanley Stumpf, y'all. Stanley Stumpf had worked alongside Sherman at Oshner in 1964 as her resident. One of the names that Oshner doctors immediately gave to police as a suspect. Stanley Stumpf. The doctors interviewed in Tyler's documentary remembered Stumpf coming in for surgery on the night of the murder when he was off shift and making a fuss of his presence like he was wanting to create an alibi. Hmm. Hey, everybody, look at me. I'm here. I'm Stumpf. But police never interviewed him. On January 31st, 1969. Oh, you mean the day after the Beatles performed their last live gig, which was a 42-minute concert? On the roof of Apple headquarters, the app, Apple the album. Oh yeah! Did you remember that? The famous. Mm-hmm, I do. That's the last time they performed live. And on the roof. Yeah. On that rooftop, and here's a couple things about that rooftop. Yeah, you're probably going to cover that more in. I will, but well, this is just a preview. Number one, you know they, you know in that there's that video of it. Yeah. They're wearing ladies' coats. Yeah. Uh, because it was so cold on the roof. Yeah. Uh, that. John Lennon borrowed Yoko Ono's fur coat, and Ringo Starr had to wear his wife's uh, red raincoat. Oh, funny. That wasn't a choice on purpose. Their microphones were wrapped in women's pantyhose because they were too cold and with the wind and everything. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, they were caught by the police. We know that. John Lennon needed cue cards to remember the lyrics because he couldn't remember any of them at this point. Uh, it was their first live performance in over two years. Because 1966 was their last concert. Why couldn't he remember the lyrics? Was it just drugs and stuff? Well, it'd been three years since they performed. Oh. Two years since they performed live. Yeah. Um, getting the Beatles to perform any kind of live show during that time was impossible because they stopped in '66 mainly because the legions of loyal fans were drowning out all their concerts. They oh were just by yeah. Screaming. They got tired of all the screaming. Like it's nobody just could screaming. Hear Nobody's hearing the music at yeah. all. So, so they and plus. A lot of their new material had complicated arrangements and stuff that were hard to play live. Yeah. Um, yeah, number nine. Number nine. Number Revolution number nine. nine. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, which you always play in uh, bar jukeboxes. Because I think it's over hysterical. Over 20 times. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that was the day. This was the day. That was the day before yeah. this happened. That, um, okay, so... On January 31st, 1969, a West Jefferson Medical Center pharmacist named Doris Handel told police about this strange man she'd been dating, and she had put a restraining order on, and it turned out to be Stanley Stumpf. Stanley Stumpf got a restraining order, y'all. She told police that when she and Stumpf began dating, she quickly learned he was a drug addict, and his behavior started to frighten her. Oh, boy. Stanley Stumpf. He would talk about... Sherman as at strange moments too. I wanted to be, I wanted to be Mrs. Stumpf so badly, but he, he was so weird. Well, she, I know he was talking about the murdered lady because he keeps talking about the murdered lady and he's so, a drug addict. And she said he carried a tear gas canister of like this kind founded found by her car. Uh oh. And in his Stumpf trunk, did it? He would regularly carry quote a chainsaw, a can of gasoline, a sharpener for his saw, an axe, and all of his fishing equipment. 
<laughs> so I don't know what he's planning. Did he have any diet soda? No. Stumps on a bump. Stumps on a All bump. Right. It stump did it. Handle, Handle told police that after she cut off his supply of to the pharmacy, he had threatened her. So that's why she placed a restraining order. Oh. But ne- neither of the theorists who have dwelled on Sherman's murder, Tyler or Haslam, makes a claim to know what happened. To Haslam, withheld evidence of a 50-year-old crime makes the task impossible. Man. And, and that's the story of the murder of Dr. Mary Sherman. That's it. That's creepy and so weird. So who do you think did that? Stumpf did it. You think? Stump, stump. What to do, what to do. Stump, stump. Okay. I love that name, Stump. Yeah. yeah, that's uh, weird and gross and creepy. My stomach hurts. Friday, July 24th, <laughs> 1964, mm-hmm. George R.R. R. Martin yeah. reportedly purchased the first ticket to attend the first ever Comic Con held in New York in 1964. What? George R.R. R. Martin reportedly bought the first ticket to the first Comic Con? Apparently, uh, this was the first recorded official comic book convention that... Uh, known as New York Comic Con, July 24th, 1964, at the Workman's Circle Building. This was a one-day convention organized by 16-year-old Bernie Bubness yeah. and fellow enthusiast Ron Fradkin. Reports were over 100 attendees. Official guests of the Tri-State Con included Steve Ditko, a comics artist and writer best known as the artist and co-creator with Stan Lee of the Marvel comic superheroes Mm Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. Mm -hmm. Steve Ditko was found unresponsive in his apartment in New York City on June 29th, 2018. Oh. (laughs) Much later. Yeah. Police said he had died within the previous two days. He was pronounced dead at age 90 with the cause of death initially deemed as a result of of myocardial infraction. Why are we talking about his death now? I thought we were talking about... Yeah, I'm just telling you how... George R.R. R. Martin going to Comic-Con. Yeah, he did, but one of the speakers was Steve Ditko, and that's how he died. And the final words of Ditko was, here's to those who wish me well and those that don't can go to hell. Another guest speaker was Flo Steinberg, who was a publisher of one of the first independent comic books, the Underground Alternative Comics Hybrid Big Apple Comics in 1975. Okay. And she was a secretary for Marvel Comics editor Stan Lee. Okay. Um, and she uh, died on July 23rd, 2017 from complications from a brain aneurysm and a metastatic lung. Why are we listening to how all these people died? <laughs> and metastatic lung cancer. Uh, and then and then the other big guest was Tom Gill, a comic book artist best better known for his nearly 11-year run drawing Dell Comics' The Lone Ranger. He died on October 17, 2005 what? of heart failure at his home in Croton on Hudson, New York. He was survived by his family, including his wife, Patricia, daughter, Nancy, and son. Tom Why are Gale. we talking about that? Because that was, I think you love death and murder so much. Oh, you're you want, trying to get, oh, so, so now, this is your, this you're, is my new thing. you're being passive aggressive right now. No, no, this is just my new thing. I think whatever we talk about, whoever we talk about, I'll tell you how they died. No, I don't want to know <laughs> how they died. In a horrible way. Since you were so obsessed with death. It was oh, a, my it was God. Pres- this, this was, was a, the thing you were going to do. Yeah, it was a birthday present for you. I thought it would be precedent setting and you would love it so much that, oh, how did that person, like whoever I talk about, oh, how did they die? I don't know. That's what you would want, no, right? No, no. Well, I know how these three died all right well i'll go put that in my back pocket yeah <laughs> put that in your pipe and smoke it and so now we're in august and so we've only done one month i know do you want to just do the one month or do you want me to go through august well it's probably time to wind it up isn't it i don't know don't even know anymore yeah we'll just call it a day let's call it a day that's it and then we'll we'll pick up in august in the next episode yep Okay, I think everybody's heard enough of you and your gross murder death and obsession. Everybody's heard enough of you and your gross death because you're telling everybody how they died. I thought that's what you wanted. I thought that's what you liked. I'm trying to. It was a birthday present for oh, you. Oh, that was very sweet. This is Amy's birthday, everybody. It was She's a very now, nice attempt. This is her 58th birthday. This is my second birthday doing the podcast. The second birthday doing a podcast. Oh. Uh, right. Yeah, so yeah, this is the second podcast birthday, and your present was telling you how. Everybody died. Comic book creators died. <laughs> Jeez. And I thought you would love it, but instead... Only if they're murdered, do I want to know? Well, I'm sure they suffered. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> in pain not, as they were dying. That's what you want, right? That's, that's what you not, like. No, that's not what I like. That's what you like No, so no, no. 
You just wish they were murdered? No, what, I don't what wish they were murdered. I just want to know if they were murdered. I don't wish anybody's murdered. Well, cancer I just want to know one. if somebody was murdered. An aneurysm murdered Flo. I mean, it, in a way, she was murdered. No, no, no. In a way, everyone's murdered. Murdered by cancer. Cancer's a murderer. All right. It's time to shut this shit down. Oh, my God. Chuck Berry's in the bathroom with us. Yes, it's time to get out of here, Chuck Berry. Let's make out with Chuck Berry and then Gross. get him out of the bathroom. All right. Is Chuck Berry alive? No, he's dead. Oh. oh, you know who is alive? Who? Matt Truman. That's right. Ego trip. Also, Carlo Summer is dead. That's true, but his Carloites live on. Carloites. And um, please feel free to tweet us. Retweet us, follow us, listen, subscribe. Give us more. Um, what are those uh, reviews on the Apple Tunes or? It's not iTunes. We got to stop sucking first before people. Yeah, Apple do Tunes. That. iTunes is not a thing anymore. It's now called Apple. What? Really? Yeah, iTunes is officially gone. It's called like Apple Podcasts or something. Or you, we're on Spotify. I think you can give reviews on Spotify. Maybe. Anyway, those of you who listen, thanks for listening. Keep yep. liking us. Um, just incessantly talk about us to get us more followers or people listening. And then the more people listen, something might Never happen. Or we'll get, no, we're not good, we're we get not money? good enough for we it. get money at all? Or no, I don't think. Are we good looking enough? Do we sound good enough? No. Who cares? I don't care if you listen, honestly. <laughs> Stop. No, I don't. We don't want you as a listener. Stop listening. Stop it. Unsubscribe. All right, time to get out of here. We don't Joker. need you. Hey, when you were all alone, no watched I were her kids in the sky. Well, I was barely a glimmer in my young daddy's eyes. Said the wind so tired of hearing about the six days. One more time, I said, We're so tired of hearing about the six days. Well, make me shut my mouth. American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com. Oh, America, America. History for jerks. Oh, History for jerks. Oh, History for jerks. America. History for jerks. History for jerks. If I could have sex with a podcast, it would be American Timelines by History for Jerks.